In this video, I'm going to look at the AQA life cycle of a star. This is a screenshot taken from the AQA specification showing the life cycle of a star as you should know it. What you should be aware of is that it starts as a cloud of gas or dust, which we call a nebula. It then moves on to a protostar. After this point, nuclear fusion begins to occur and we call it a main sequence star, which is a point which our sun is at at the moment. Depending on the size of the star, it can take one of two options. You can either go down here, which is the process our, star, our sun will take, or it can go this way, which is the direction that a star much bigger than our sun will take. Well, the next part of the video, we're going to look at both directions a star can take, and we'll talk about the different aspects or parts of a star's life cycle. So all stars start off as a nebula, and what happens in a nebula is that the force of gravity brings together clouds of gas and dust. We can see here there's an image of a nebula, and we can see the force of gravity um, is an attractive force which brings the dust and gas together. As you get more dust and gas, you get larger forces of gravity. And that continues to pull and pull more things together until eventually you get a protostar. A protostar is when the forces of gravity continue to contract the star, but the star isn't hot enough for nuclear fusion to begin. We can see here an image of a protostar. It will begin to get hot, its pressure will increase, its temperature will increase until the point where nuclear fusion begins. As soon as nuclear fusion begins, that we call that a main sequence star. Once the pressure and temperature is hot enough for nuclear fusion to occur, that is now a main sequence star. Up until this point, we've only looked at uh, the force of gravity, and the force of gravity is what pulls the dust and gas together to form the protostar, and it continues to act on all stars. But in this case, what we've got is that the gravity is pulling all the dust and gas together, it's bringing the nuclei together, but at this point, we've got it hot, and hot enough, dense enough, and enough pressure for nuclear fusion to begin, and nuclear fusion creates its own pressure force, which is equal but in the opposite direction to the force of gravity. So the pressure force is pushing outwards, gravity is pushing in, inwards, but those forces are balanced, which means that the main sequence star is stable. What we're going to look at now is how uh, the process of nuclear fusion produces energy. So nuclear fusion is a process in which stars create their own energy. It's also a process in which we get heavier elements forming. Um, so if you remember at the beginning we only had dust and gas, that's mainly hydrogen gas, um, so the, this is the most abundant element in the universe is hydrogen. Um, so at the beginning you just have hydrogen nuclei. And what happens inside a star is you take those hydrogen nuclei and they combine through nuclear fusion to produce a heavier nucleus and that also releases energy. So you can see here that you've got tritium and deuterium coming together. They fuse together to produce helium and an extra neutron, which will go on and form part of a, a join another deuterium atom to make tritium. And that process releases energy which then produces the pressure force which balances out gravity. It's worth pointing out that in, at the beginning of time there was only hydrogen and helium that were present and that all the other elements have been formed by this process of nuclear fusion combining smaller nuclei to form larger nuclei and release energy. So now we'll look at what happens to stars after the main sequence. So we're going to look at what happens to stars about the same size as our sun. We start off with a main sequence star and now what we're looking at is when it becomes a red giant, it will then become a white dwarf, and then finally a black dwarf. We need to look at what each part of that sequence looks like. So the first stage we'll look at is a red giant. Eventually the main sequence star will run out of hydrogen to fuse. At this point what's going to happen is that the pressure force of nuclear fusion is going to decrease. The force of gravity will take over and actually causes the, um, the star to begin to shrink. What that does is that that increases the temperature, um, and increase the pressure until the fusion of helium is possible and that then will cause an increase in the pressure force which causes the star to expand. So you can see here at this point that the pressure force is unstable, uh, the force of gravity remains constant but we've got a, a shrinking effect and then an expanding effect which eventually leads to the red giant. Now red giant will fuse heavier elements including helium and some beyond sometimes um, to produce even heavier elements still. And all that process, remember, produce energy. The red giants themselves, though, will, will not be able to get hot enough to fuse really heavy elements. Okay, so elements much heavier than helium and hydrogen. Um, so what happens at that point is that the force of gravity will cause them to collapse. As soon as they are, st 
unable to get the temperatures required to fuse heavier elements, the force of gravity becomes greater than the pressure force of nuclear fusion, and that force of gravity causes the star to collapse. They'll eventually reach about the same size as our Earth. Um, no fusion continues, but white dwarfs continue to emit leftover energy as light. Eventually they will not emit any light, and they'll become known as black dwarfs. It's interesting to point out that at the moment there are no black dwarfs, because the time taken to become a black dwarf is longer than the age of the universe itself. So we'll now look at um, what would happen to stars much bigger than our sun. Okay, um, So we've seen that we have main sequence stars, they'll then become red supergiants, they'll go through supernova, and then they'll either become a neutron star or a black hole. So a red supergiant um, is the first stage we'll look at. Unlike a red giant, a red supergiant can get hot enough to fuse elements heavier than helium. So with a red giant, it wouldn't fuse much larger elements than, than helium itself, whereas a red supergiant can fuse elements much larger than helium. Okay, so it will fuse all the elements up to iron, and the pr pressure forces created by nuclear fusion of heavier elements cause it to expand further. So pressure force becomes greater than gravity, causing this expansion. If, uh, what we're going to look at now is the, the sort of cross-sectional area of a uh, red supergiant. So you can see that what happens is the fusion takes place and it causes a red supergiant to become layered. So you've got different layers depending on sort of things like neon fusion, oxygen fusion. But the inside part, the central part known as the core, is this, this iron core. And you cannot fuse iron because it doesn't produce you any energy. So eventually what's going to happen is you're going to end up with a, a, a large iron core in the centre and nuclear fusion is going to dwindle out in the other areas of the red supergiant until eventually gravity will cause it to collapse. So eventually, um, a red supergiant will run out of elements to fuse. At this point, the gravitational force is greater than the pressure of nuclear fusion, the pressure force produced by nuclear fusion, and that causes the star to collapse quite rapidly. This rapid collapse causes a huge explosion, and that's known as a supernova. So a supernova is a huge explosion, at the end of a red supergiant, and that huge explosion produces all the elements heavier than iron. Um, and also what's important is that supernova then distributes all those elements throughout the universe. Now the fact that the Earth contains elements that are heavier than iron is proof that the Earth was once part of a large star that was a red supergiant and then went supernova, because the only way we could have elements that are heavier than iron on the Earth, such as gold, is to have been part of a supernova at some point. So after the supernova has taken place, one of two things can happen. If the star's around about 4 to 8 solar masses, so 4 to 8 times um, the mass of our, our sun, it will become a neutron star. So once su the supernova has happened, the outside layers of the star get blasted into space, um, but the, the core of the star and the other parts of the star still continue to get crushed by gravity. Um, and gravity is so strong, it's so, so massive, this star, that the gravity will actually force... Um, the protons and electrons into one another to become neutrons and the only thing that holds this star apart from complete collapse is the force of repulsion between the neutrons hence the name neutron star neutron stars sometimes will spin due, due to this rapid collapse so they're sometimes known as pulsars and you can see here in the diagram that we get like a beam of radiation emitted out the tops of the stars due to their high magnetic field so for stars even more massive than those that go on to create neutron stars, they become black holes. Okay, and in that case, is that the force of gravity is so strong, the star was so massive before it collapsed, that the force of gravity is so strong that the gravity can actually overcome this neutron repulsion, and what is left is a region of space that has a very high gravitational field. This gravitational field is so intense that no matter or radiation can escape. It's an incredibly dense spot in the universe. So when the examiners come to assess you on the life cycle of a star, they tend to look in three areas. The first is, can you describe the process of a life cycle of a star? So can you take it from the star forming as a nebula and the collection of the gas and dust to going through to, to a protostar to a main sequence star, and then how it splits and eventually end up as a black dwarf, a neutron star or a black hole, which I feel as though we've done in the previous slide. The other part that they'll often look at is, can you explain how the forces acting on the star change. So from it, you know, the gravitational force is always constant, but and it's always directed towards the centre, so it's always trying to pull it together and cause the star to collapse. But how does the pressure force of nuclear fusion vary 
as it goes through. And again, I feel as though we've done that in the slides. But just to highlight, there's no nuclear fusion here, so there's no pressure force. It's just gravity pulling things together and making them hotter and more dense. At this point here, the force are balanced. You've got nuclear fusion taking place, so the pressure force is equal to gravity for a main sequence star. That's the most stable part of its life. To go on to form the red giants, what's happening there is that the nuclear fusion is inconsistent. You get different amounts of pressure force. Remember, gravity always remains the same, but sometimes gravity is causing the star to collapse. That increases temperature and pressure until fusion of a different element takes place, and that then causes an expansion because the nuclear pressure force from nuclear fusion is greater than the force of gravity. And then obviously, once nuclear fusion stops, which at this point it does, then gravity is the only force left, so that causes a collapse. In a white dwarf, that's held apart by repulsion from the electrons, that's the force that gets it there, or electron repulsion. Whereas in a neutron star, the thing that's keeping that apart is neutron repulsion. And with black hole, there's nothing that stops gravity. Gravity completely crushes the star into a very small, very dense spot. The final part to look at is is what happens with elements and how the elements are formed. So the key thing is that at the beginning in a protostar, you've only got hydrogen and some helium present at that point. Remember that the vast majority of the universe is made up of hydrogen. Once you get a main sequence star, what you're starting to have is nuclear fusion is taking place and that hydrogen's being fused to form helium. In a red giant, is mainly the fusion of helium you sometimes have a few other elements that are fused as well, but it's mostly the fusion of helium. Whereas in a red supergiant, you get the fusion of all elements up to and including iron. But the key thing you need to remember is that any element that's heavier than iron must have come through a supernova. The other thing you might be asked in the exam is how is it that we know that the Earth was once part of a, a large star, and that's because it contains elements heavier than iron. And the only way that, that can happen is for it to have been a supernova at some point. And also, similarly for ourselves, as humans we've got heavy elements in our bodies, and those elements have come from nuclear fusion in stars, and then have been distributed throughout the universe via supernova. Thank you for listening.